Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers, and welcome back to Women's View on Ahl Bay TV. Now, if you are watching before the break, you would know we're speaking about genital baqi, the destruction of genital baqi. Today's topic is your solutions to the genital baqi crisis. We'd like to hear from you. We've got many of your comments already sent in and many of your emails, but we'd like to hear from you. If you have any opinions, if you want to express any um, opinions regarding this issue, then please do call in with the number on the screen. We'd love to hear from you. Alternatively, you can email us at womensview at ehlbait.tv. That's womensview at ehlbait.tv. You can also tweet us or post any messages on Facebook. Now, um, before the break, we did speak about the historical side of genital baqi. Um, we have many more videos to show you, some very disturbing images as well. And we'll be speaking about many issues. So, today's topic is, like I said, your solution to the crisis of genital baqi. I'm your host, Zahra Al Alawi, and today with me is Sister Layla Hussain. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Now, before the break, we had a nice discussion before the salah. Mm -hmm. And now, moving on, I mean, do you have any descriptions of how genital baqi was before being destroyed? There is actually a very beautiful description uh, mm -hmm. by an early scholar who had visited Al Baqi, and I'm, I'm going to read it. Obviously, I didn't have time to memorize it, mm -hmm. so I apologize for that. But uh, nevertheless, I'm going to read it, and, and we can all imagine, I think all lovers of Harold Bait, close our eyes and imagine how it was before when we see the, the pictures nowadays of the destruction. There is, a, there is nothing there left. And, and how was it before? Um, al Baqi is situated to the east of Medina. You enter it through the gate known as the Gate of Al Baqi. As you enter, the first grave you see on your left is that of Safiya, the Prophet's aunt, and further still is the grave of Malik ibn Anas, the Imam of Medina. On his grave is raised a small dome. In front of it is the grave of Ibrahim, son of the, son of the Prophet, sorry, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with a white dome over it. And next to it on the right is the grave of Abdurrahman, son of, of Umar ibn Khattab, popularly known as Abu Shahma whose father had kept punishing him till death overtook him. Facing it are the graves of Akil ben Abi Talib and Abdullah ibn Jafar at Tariya. Um, there, facing those graves, is a small shrine containing the graves of the Prophet's wives, following by a shrine of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Then the grave of Hassan ibn Ali salam, situated near the gate to its right hand, has an elevated dome over it. His head lies at the feet of Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, and both graves are raised high above the ground. Their walls are panelled with yellow plates and studded with beautiful star-shaped nails. This is how the grave of Ibrahim, son of the Prophet wasallam, has also been adorned. Behind the shrine of Abbas, there is the house attributed to Fatima, daughter of our Prophet wasallam, known as Bayt al-Ahzan, the house of grief because it is the house she used to frequent in order to mourn the death of her father, the Chosen One, peace be upon him. At the farthest end of al Baqi is the grave of the Caliph Uthman with a small dome over it, and there next to it is the grave of Fatima bint Assad, mother of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Wow, amazing description. All these people uh, buried there, and, and the way that they kept it. This, we're talking here about early companions. Mm. So when um, the, the Wahhabi ideology is saying that it's, it's not allowed, yeah. um, basically what they say is that we have to follow the three first generation of Muslims, so the Prophet's generation, and then the, the two other generations are following. They said these are the best of Muslims. But these best of Muslims that they are revering are the ones who have actually adorned these places and these tombs so we can remember them, so mm. we know who is buried where. Definitely, yeah. Mm. It's amazing, I mean, how it was before. And like you said, no one really refuted that it w whether it was or not allowed to build mm. until recently when the um, Wahhabis came, let's say, and then yeah. destroyed or all the religious sites. Um, let's just go off to a quick um, clip now. Like I said at the beginning in part one that we did get quite a lot of phone calls recorded on our Ahl Bay TV voicemail messages of viewers um, from around the world expression, expressing their outrage to the destruction of genital baqi. So we did record some of these um, phone calls and some of these messages and we did play them throughout the channel. So have a look at another phone call. Oh, 
campaign is not going to be enough, my brothers and sisters in Islam. One campaign is not going to be stopped. You should do more of those campaigns so everybody else can hear our voices and we keep our heritage. We, we keep what our left there, like House of Sayyid al-Shuhada Hamza, House of Sayyidatana Fatima al-Zahra, alayhi salam and everything like this is left there. Assalamu alaikum. So that was a phone call from one of our viewers um, expressing their outrage at what happened. And like he said, he said one campaign is not going to be enough. So we need to constantly talk about Janat al Baqit, spread awareness, and show the world that what is happening over there. So um, inshallah, we have more clips to show the audience mm. as well, more videos. But um, like before, before we showed the video, you said about the description of Janet al -Baqi. So now, how was it destroyed? I mean, how was Janet al destroyed? Well, there were two main points in history where the, the Wahhabis have started destroying that place. Uh, the first one being in the year 1790, starting, and then the second time in 1924. Uh, up till now, obviously, they've never stopped. Um, now... Uh, what happened uh, in um, 1806, uh, the Wahhabis entered Medina uh, to desecrate al baqi as well as every mosque that they came across. Um, so an, even an attempt to demolish the Prophet's uh, grave was made. And obviously they stopped it because I think that's as far as they will be able to go, to be quite honest. I've heard actually recently that they were talking about uh, perhaps destroying the Prophet's tomb as well. Yeah. There was a fatwa given, I think, that they want to destroy the Prophet's grave as well. Exactly. Mm. I don't think this is ever going to be um, led by, by the Muslims. I, mm. I hope not. Um, and um, so, like I said, 19, uh, sorry, 1806, um, the, the Wahhabis started to destroy. And also, they forbade the Muslims who were not adhering to their ideology to go on Hajj. Uh, so people from Iraq, Syria, Egypt were refused in, uh, entry into Mecca mm. uh, on the grounds that they were infidels because they were seen as grave worshippers. So mm. um, <clears throat> al-Baqi was raised to the ground, no sign of any grave or tomb whatsoever. And um, the, the, the Wahhabis also what they've done because uh, some people were leaving presents uh, on these places, mm. not only they destroyed everything, but they took all the, the money and all the you know presents and just uh, for themselves for their own benefit. And thousands of Muslim uh, Muslims sorry fled Mecca and Medina in a bid to save their lives. So that was as serious as that. Their life was threatened. It's not just about the the, the graves and and the domes. It was also the people who were living there. Uh, who, if they were not adhering to the ideology, were going to be killed as kafir. So <clears throat> this, uh, this was the first, uh, first attempt. And then uh, the Muslims have uh, called uh, the, uh, uh, the Ottoman Caliph at the time mm. to actually come and help them because they could see that this, there was no end to that destruction and these murders. Mm. And um, Muhammad Ali Basha attacked Hijaz at that time and stopped the Wahhabis and uh, re, uh, reinstated order in there and what they've done the ottomans is that actually they rebuilt everything at that time mm. all the shrines all the graves they they done so so beautifully and and um, everything was restored so that was the first time that the wahhabis actually destroyed janat al mm. uh, then there was uh, the second time uh, which is in 1924 uh, when uh, the wahhabis entered hijaz for a second time so this time they allied uh, with Al Saud, and this is where the Al Saud dynasty started. And uh, all the houses were razed to the ground. Uh, women and children were killed during that, that, that particular event. And uh, I've got here something really heartbreaking. Uh, um, the chef of Mecca, On ibn uh, Hashim, said, Before me, a valley appeared to have been paved with corpses dried blood staining everywhere all around. There was hardly a tree which didn't have one or two dead bodies near its roots. That's how severe it was. Mm. And uh, in 1925, Madina uh, al-Munawara surrendered the Wahhabi onslaught 
and all Islamic heritage were destroyed there and then. Yeah. And, and um, so we had tombs of Hamza and other martyrs were demolished at uh, Uhud. The Prophet's mosque was bombarded, and um, obviously the Muslims tried to protest. The Sauds tried to calm them down, saying that everything will be rebuilt again. Unfortunately, they've never done that, and they've only just carried on destroying everything. Yeah. I think like the hatred that is described within destructing the graves, I mean, I think that's still present today. I mean, the viewers, I'm sure anyone that's been to Amr al-Hajj has seen the hatred of the Saudis towards mm. the followers of the Ahl bayt I mean, someone recently went to, um, went to Amr and then afterwards, um, when I came back, I said, oh, how was your trip? They said, well, when we got to um, the grave of the Prophet, there was just a man standing there and he was kind of hitting people yeah. and saying, Laknatullah ala zairin, may Allah curse the visitors. Mm. So basically, talking about the visitors of the Prophet. Or, yes. um, so it's really like, I mean, it's very shocking seeing the hatred towards um, the followers of the Halbayt and how such a thing as visiting the Prophet's grave, or even the reason why many people say they destroy Jannat al Baqi is so people don't visit them. So it just shows the hatred of them. Mm. Uh, what is even more surprising is that their own kings are buried in a lot of mm. luxury. Yeah. So is there not a problem with burying their own kings in nice graves and mm. nice domes? And there is a lot of, I'm sorry to say, hypocrisy going yeah. on uh, with their government. Also, when they destroy one Islamic building, uh, Islamic Muslim heritage, they actually, what they, do they build on the top of it? Five stars hotels, mm. um, luxury complex. Do we need that as Hajj? Is that, is that the spirit of Hajj going in a five star hotel? Mm. Instead of, uh, I wouldn't have the heart personally to stay in such a hotel if I knew that a grave of a companion or a grave of, of, of someone who is respected by the Prophet was there. Yeah. I, I, it, it's, I think it's all about uh, the money uh, versus uh, the, the pure Islamic theology. And, and there is here a big conflict. Um, they, obviously, they claim that they are the ones who are uh, keeping the haramain. Uh, but as we all know, they are destroying every single parcel of Muslim history. And, and what are we going to show to our children in 10, 20 years' time if this carries on? Mm. Like we just mentioned, they wanted to, to destroy the grave of the Prophet wasallam. If that were to happen, what are we going to show? What, what image does it give about the Muslims when they are the ones... Because Salafis are the ones who are spreading the ideology because they've, obviously they've got the funds to do so. Mm. Um, if we go to a, a Muslim bookstore, for example, this is mainly this ideology that is spread in the mm. West, etc. So why is it showing about us as Muslims that we destroy our own revered people's places where they've been buried? It just doesn't make sense. I think it's probably the first time in history that people do that to themselves. It's, it's very, very sad. It's shocking, the Muslim Ummah. I mean, you would think that this is our prophet and mm. this is our Ahl Bayt. So technically, we should be the ones looking after the Ahl Bayt yeah. and the prophet. But it seems they have no respect at all. Let me just read one comment post on face mm. Facebook because there was quite a lot of comments posted there and many comments, um, emails coming in as well. Um, Abdul Alim Jabbar says, simply get rid of the Celtic government. That's the only solution. <laughs> Anyone who destroys religious sites of the Ahl Bayt is the enemy of Islam. My heart is bleeding, bleeding for gentle baqi outrage. So then he comments a lot. He says, I want you in a live show to send messages to the Saudis that we followers have had enough of them attacking Ahl Bayt. Ahl Bayt get killed and still now they are oppressed. And that's something you mentioned, I mean, with the Saudi government. I mean, mm. you said that like many of their kings are buried in luxurious places. I was actually a Saudi scholar and I actually saw that he made a statement. He said, all my life living in Mecca and Medina, I have not visited the Prophet's grave, not even once. And he was so proud that during all these years living in, um, in Saudi that he hasn't really visited the Prophet's grave, not even once. And there was other pictures of him kissing the uh, king's hand of Saudi Arabia. And I'm saying, if you're giving that much respect and kissing the hand mm -hmm. of, a, of a human being who's just a king, let's say, yes. which means nothing, then, and you're so proud of not visiting the Prophet's grave, not even once, that's just ridiculous. 
But um, mm. coming to the contemporary issue now, let me just show the audience two videos, inshallah, we'll come back. For the audience, like we said, that genital baqi, the crisis of genital baqi, or the whole notion of destroying religious sites and religious graves still affects us today. Um, when we come back, inshallah, I'll show you two videos. When we come back, we'll be speaking about the current situation of destroying religious sites. So these, some of these images are disturbing. Let me just explain them. We'll be showing you two videos. The first video um, shows how um, religious sites and... Um, let's say the places of the Ahl Bayt are being destroyed in um, the places of the Ahl Bayt are still being destroyed that's Samara and Iraq we'll come and explain it in a minute and the other video shows a completely different side of a video taking place in Somalia where they are destroying um, graves of their clerics so have a look at the video, at the video and then inshallah we'll come back and discuss it By the Quranic verses and the Islamic proof, many individuals think otherwise. <laughs> The destruction of graves still takes place today and continues to do so. <laughs> In 2008, graves of clerics and personalities were destroyed, hammered and vandalized. Most of these graves have been there for over a century. The destruction of genital baqi is an example of state-led vandalism and a grave crime towards the whole mankind by destroying historical and sacred places. This continues till today. Assalamualaikum, welcome back. Now, as you saw, the first video was a video taking place in Somalia. Now, these clerics have been, their graves have been present for many years, but um, in 2008 were all destroyed and leveled, and these were religious figures from the Sunni school of thought, and um, for many people living in Somalia. And the second video was of um, Samara. I mean, this issue still kind of affects us today. I mean, just a few um, months ago, we saw the destruction of um, religious sites in Bahrain, mm. and um, you know this is not even whether we kind of or the audience kind of agree with the political situation happening in Bahrain or not. This is religious sites like, like I was saying in Bahrain, there is a companion of Imam Ali buried in in Bahrain, um, and he has a masjid, Masjid um, Sa'sa, that's his name. So. Mm. Um, that's a religious site in Bahrain. This is a religious figure buried yeah. in Bahrain. And um, when this whole issue happened, they went and destroyed sections of the masjid. Mm -hmm. And they went and destroyed many, many masjids, and many graves. They went into cemeteries and destroyed graves as well. Just like the video we saw of them destroying graves in Somalia, they destroyed graves in Bahrain as well. So I think this still happens today. I mean, number one, does this still affect us today? And number two, what can we do as a solution? Mm. Of course it is affecting us. These are our historical figures. These mm -hmm. are our imams that we're talking about. We have to understand, we have to wonder what are the motivations of the Saudis to do that, mm -hmm. to the, of the Salafis. What can be their motivation? Because like you said, it is also in Africa that it started, Bahrain, other countries. Mm -hmm. Why do they do that? What do they want to achieve? That's one thing that we have to ask ourselves. And do we want to let that happen? Mm -hmm. Because uh, personally, I would like my children to be able to go on Hajj and still know where the imams are buried. Mm. I, want to, I want them to be able to, to do ziyarat of them, to do ziyarat of the family of the Prophet or, 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 this, or his pious companions. 
So of course it is an issue that is affecting us and should affect us and we should take it a, a lot more seriously, not just now that it's the anniversary of al Bakri and then for one year we forget about it. Mm. No, this is something that we have to act upon now before it gets even worse. The damage has already been done, let's face it. Mm. But perhaps if, if we would put a little bit more pressure, a little bit more lobbying, it would be useful. Uh, so, for example, I've, I've uh, heard a, a suggestion from a brother to uh, perhaps um, write to the UNESCO who are actually looking after um, historical heritage mm. and tell them this is not acceptable mm. to, to, to have that destroyed in front of our eyes like this. Now, obviously, the issue is that the Saudi um, government is, is very powerful because of their natural resources as gas, petrol, which, you know, uh, so there are a lot of implications. It's not that easy. However, it, it is something that is so important for a historical point of view, even for non-Muslims, to have these sites preserved. And, and it would be so great. I, I obviously, when the Imam Mahdi and Islam will come back, then, you know, the, these issues will be resolved, inshallah. But it would be so good to be able to do something for our Imams now. So, petitions, um, online, uh, you know, we, we have seen now in the past months how so many regimes from, uh, from countries who had stayed their dictatures from tens of years, they've been abolished. Can we not do, can we not do something about this issue? If we all put ourselves together, and it's not even a Shia Sunni issue here, the Sunnis should be also with us because this is also their personalities buried there. It's not just about our imams. Yeah. Our imams are also their imams, or at least should be, their companions. Mm. We should all be united against this, and we should all do something. So like I said, petitions, uh, writing to the government, to various governments, to the UNESCO. Um, there was today actually a protest outside the Saudi embassy here in London. Mm. So doing more of these things and, and raise awareness to the non-Muslim world, because unfortunately we can't really count on Muslim countries nowadays. Yeah. Uh, so the non-Muslim world, to, uh, to let them know what's going on and, and obviously that, that we want to protect our history. Mm. Definitely. I mean, there's so much we can do. And I think sometimes we as Muslims have really disappointed ourselves and not doing enough. These are our Ahl Bayt. And I think many mm. Muslims, you know, should ask themselves, what have we really done to kind of protect genital baqi? And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sad to see the graves of the Imams. You know, even when I go to a grave of a, hum a normal human being, like a relative or something, they have a, their grave is in a better state than the Imam, mm. where it's just on raw ground and hot hot land of Saudi Arabia and, you know, with a few stones on top. On top. It's just really sad to see the current um, state of the graves of the Imams. Yeah. But like you said, there's so much we can do to kind of spread awareness, even if it's spreading awareness to... Um, to one person, let's say, mm. you know, when we spread awareness, that understanding comes about and people are aware of what's happening. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it just comes into my mind uh, very often uh, as Shia, we have this slogan, may, may our life be ransom for our Imams. But do we really mean it? Because we are seeing our Imams being desecrated like this, just mm. in front of our eyes. What do we do about it? Are we even, does it stop us eating? Does it stop us watching a movie afterwards or mm. laughing? Unfortunately not. So definitely we have to be a lot more proactive about this. And, and I appeal to all the viewers who are watching now and are also scandalized by what's going on to actually try to do more, create Facebook pages. Mm. Like I said, raise more awareness. Please, we really have to act now before it's, it's even too late. But like I said, it's already late. But even more than that. Definitely true. We're going off for a quick break, so inshallah we'll be coming back mm -hmm. after the break. After the break, inshallah we'll be speaking more about the sites destroyed in Saudi Arabia. We'll also be speaking about reading more of your comments, so please do join us in a few minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.